Welcome back to Modern Operating Systems. This is the second lecture on system calls. So we'll be picking up where we left off in the last lecture. Um, and, and the last lecture, just as a, as a short recap, we were trying to talk a lot about the motivation and then the mechanism that gets used for switching control between application processes and the kernel or the operating system itself. Um, and so this lecture will be uh, a little bit more mechanistic and we'll dive into how uh, system calls actually look in detail uh, in sort of a modern Linux operating system. A lot of what happens when the CPU uh, and the hardware architecture switches between a user mode and a kernel mode is around memory, uh, both both memory and what instructions are available. So, so there's a, a protection layer of which subset of instructions you're allowed to make that will work. And more importantly though, is how the hardware architecture is interacting with memory. And we'll be getting to that in upcoming lectures where we talk a little bit more in detail about what architectural memory and the memory management of an operating system looks like. But, but that should fill in sort of some of your remaining questions and gaps about what it actually means to be in user mode versus kernel mode. Uh, hopefully that picture will clarify with some more description of memory because a lot of what this boils down to when we think about uh, am I in kernel mode is do I have access to the data structures and the management that the kernel is doing? So can I see this memory? Because when I'm in an application process, uh, in general, the answer is no. The typical mechanism for what actually happens when you're saying, I don't have the ability to make an instruction because in assembly, in the, in the executable code of a program, I can put the instruction, right? I can put any arbitrary byte value and ask the CPU to execute that as part of my executable. We have not many platforms or, or systems where we actually do any sort of validation of an application to make sure it's not trying to execute a specific instruction because it turns out that's hard and uh, applications sometimes will self-modify their code so they will as they're running change the memory of their code and then try and execute that new code that they've just written themselves and you stop being able to do that if you need to restrict them from actually making a call uh, we can talk a little bit later about that sort of protection that that uh, there, there's work on limiting uh, the, the actual instructions that a program can send and generate for the CPU uh, that get used in some sandboxing and protection schemes. Uh, so most notably, uh, the, the Google team uh, or, or various teams within Google did first a, a protection system called Native Client and more recently we have something that uh, a bunch of web browsers have implemented called WebAssembly. Uh, and one of the features of these programs is they allow for a static pass by the browser or by the operating system to ensure that there are specific statically analyzable, which means that something can pre-process, read through the file, the executable, um, check a set of properties. And if those properties are true, it means that there actually are indeed specific instructions that will not happen uh, and, and some additional guarantees about the safety of the code that, that the operating system can learn. In general though, the way that a program is limited by the operating system is that when it attempts to do one of these higher privileged instructions that the operating system uh, should only be able to do, the CPU will trigger something called a fault or an exception. And this looks in many ways like an inter interrupt, which is the CPU will switch its uh, mode back to some location defined early on in startup by the by the operating system itself and say this this uh, program attempted to do this thing you should handle it uh, and then it's up to the operating system to decide if it's going to ignore it if it's going to uh, exit the program and say that program is being bad uh, or, or respond in some other way 
Um, so there's there's a uh, a way for the operating system typically to register sort of to handle these illegal instructions, uh, and and then the most common response is they will terminate the offending program that's attempted to do something that it's not allowed to do. What I want to do in the rest of this lecture is dive a little bit deeper uh, and trace one of these system calls through Linux. So we're going to look at um, the open system call, so opening a file uh, from where you would call it until uh, some of the in-kernel functions that are attempting to respond to that. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll take a, some minutes to do that, and then we'll also just have another short uh, look at a command line uh, and, and look at how in Linux you sort of interact and see the processes that are running on your machine and, and start to see sort of what the flip side. So this is, this is sort of theory and the code and then, okay, so I've got a running Linux system. What does this actually mean in practice? So if you are opening a file, you, you often will use something like fopen. And one of the commands that you have in Linux on the command line is man. Man is for manual, and we'll show you a help page, a, a, a example usage. But uh, you'll see that, that a common way to open files in, in most C, C++ variants is fopen. Uh, and so we can look at this just top synopsis, and you see that fopen is defined in a system header, a, a, a definition that is going to be quite common, uh, the, the STDIO, the standard IO library. And it says that I get this, uh, a type called file in all caps. Uh, I get a pointer to that when I call fopen, uh, and I pass in my, uh, the file that I would like to open and a mode, which is the permissions. Do I want it to be read only or read write? Okay. So, so we can go look at STDIO and, and see what is fopen. Um, and so this is an example of an implementation. This one I think is from some BSD, but they're all basically the same. Uh, when when fopen gets called, it is a function that is linked uh, into your program. So we haven't jumped the operating system yet, but we run this function just in, in terms of your program. We're, we're going to make one of these struct objects that you're getting returned. And we get an integer called f. And then you'll see that on line 53, we say that this integer f is equal to open of file uh, with the flags and then some uh, additional mode that open needs that you didn't pass. So essentially what you've called is a shortcut that does some helper function to give you uh, a file pointer object that is a handle that is a little bit easier for you to work with in some ways. Uh, it defines a set of methods uh, associated with that. Um, just to, to sort of help with your accounting as a, as a programmer, uh, that all is happening inside of your application space. Uh, and, and the actual call that's happening here to get the file that all of the operations will happen on is this call to open on line 53. Okay, so what is open? Well, we can, we can ask for a manual there as well. So open, we're seeing, returns an integer. Uh, you can pass in this additional mode, but um, there's a few things that we need to include to be able to use open. Uh, a lot of these are in uh, the system definition of, of uh, types and stat. Um, so, uh, in fact, we need stat, I believe, for this, this mode uh, type, um, and, and it's going to be types that's going to define this open. Okay, so I've got this call to open. Where is open defined? Well, open is defined actually in the kernel primarily. Um, so we can look in at the kernel um, and, and there's in Linux, uh, so include slash Linux slash syscalls.h. And this actually exists sort of in the kernel source code. We can see that there's definitions of a lot of different system calls. Uh, and so the, the relevant system call here is that there's going to be something called sysopen. And you can see here that it takes, uh, you know, uh, the file name and flags and the mode. So, so this is the same definition essentially. There's a lot of extra uh, stuff around here that gets used by the kernel to sort of be in many ways generic across a lot of different platforms. So for instance, um, this underscore underscore user uh, in the first argument, so const char underscore underscore user uh, pointer file name, the user flag is indicating that this character string, this C string that has the file name of the file that's supposed to be open, 
is living in the user memory. It's not a kernel string, it's a user string. And so we're being explicit about our expectations regarding arguments that are more than just a number. So a number would actually, like flags, we don't have to specify anything on. It'll go directly because it's a single four byte word. However, uh, a character or string that's sort of variable length, um, we're, we're setting this expectation and having some helper functions that help us indicate that that's memory that's going to live in the user space, not in the kernel space. So we're, we're being clear about where these things live. Okay, so, so we've got this function definition called sysopen. Where does that actually exist? Well, the, the place where it exists um, is, is here. Um, and, and this is going to be in, um, in fs slash open dot c. And we see that there's a function called do sysopen. Uh, and this is going to take something quite similar. Uh, we've got a file name, we've got flags, we've got mode. We also have this other argument now that's creeped in called dfd. And this is yet another variant of open. Remember how I was talking last lecture about how a system call is actually not very polymorphic, that, that there's a single set of arguments that you would need. So it turns out that later uh, people realized that there were some additional arguments that they would want when they uh, open a file uh, for some types of files. And so a new system call that takes this additional argument was created and the more standard open call, which takes three arguments, remains as a function that takes three arguments. And we see uh, at line uh, 1107 in this file um, that, that open is going to call do sys open. And the first argument at underscore fdcwd is a default value that gets placed. And so we have one definition uh, or one implementation uh, and we pass an argument default here. So the interesting thing here uh, is the macro uh, that happens at line 1102. Uh, and so this is where we say syscall define three. So we are defining a system call whose name is open, this first argument. And then which the three here, uh, it means it takes three arguments. So open of, uh, and, and we, because this is a macro, um, we, we actually pass the types and the names of the types as different arguments to it. That's how it's constructed. But, but again, you see something that looks like we're going to make the open system call implementation uh, that takes in file name, which is a const char user star, uh, flags, which is an int, and mode, which is a umode t. And that's going to call our implementation do sysopen. Okay. So we've got an implementation. We've got this definition called sysopen. We've defined the system call. But, but there's still this linkage of how does this sysopen and this system call definition um, actually become the thing that gets uh, called when my user program calls open. So the, the final step actually happens um, in uh, an architecture specific way, which means that uh, to jump into a specific system call uh, has moved into sort of the specific type of architecture. So in this case, we are looking at an x86 architecture and we see in x86, uh, so arch x86, so we're looking at x86 specific code in the Linux kernel, uh, in the folder entry slash syscalls, um, we have something called the syscall32.table. There's also a syscall64.table for x86-64. And this is entry points. And so um, we can see on line 19 here, system call 5 for i386 is open and is implemented by sysopen. Okay. And so this is a table that then gets used um, in the in the same folder in the Linux source code. There's a bash script. Uh, so there's a preprocessor that takes this table, chain, turns it into a set of macros uh, that get used in a couple different places in terms of generating lookup tables for how does, okay, I got an interrupt. I'm gonna look at the interrupt code. In this case, open was five, uh, and that will cause me to run the sysopen entry point. And the same table gets used such that when open is called by the client program, it can look up this table and say, oh, I'm supposed to be calling system call number five. Uh, that's what open uh, translates into. So it gets used on both sides of the system call boundary. Cool. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So you can go a long ways into this. I encourage you to look through the Linux kernel. So uh, you can find this uh, either on your computer at slash user slash source slash Linux. Um, 
is typically where it gets installed. Uh, and it's often in your source package repositories. So you should find some way to get Linux source uh, as, a, as a package that will then download uh, or, or install a folder with the source code behind your kernel. So uh, later I'll, I'll encourage and, and talk a little bit through the mechanism of actually compiling your own kernel so that you can change some of the stuff happening in the operating system and then restart and run your new operating system uh, or your modified operating system. Because that's good practice to just understand how this stuff is actually happening in practice. Um, but the, the code is also available online. Uh, kernel.org is the official Linux uh, source code, uh, well, Linux kernel development organization. Uh, so they manage the Linux kernel uh, and they provide a web interface by which you can browse through and see the current source uh, of, of all the various parts of, of the Linux kernel. One thing that we covered, I'm going to change gears just a little bit. One thing that we covered in the last lecture to some extent was we talked about different types of operating systems. Uh, and we talked about um, unikernels versus, you know, uh, sort of the traditional uh, modular or monolithic kernel, um, and, and then microkernels and sort of these other architectures. Um, one of the important high level choices. Uh, in operating systems, or one other way to divide them that we didn't talk about, uh, but is relevant here, is how the operating system schedules and manages processes. So we haven't talked about scheduling yet, and, and there will be a separate lecture where we talk more in depth about scheduling policies and how we're actually going to choose, okay, I've got two tasks running, which one do I run next, how long do I run it, right? Because this is, this is a question where I need some algorithm or some answer to specifically do something. But we should understand sort of at a high level what that actually means. And we talked about that a little bit already when we said that one of the things we're going to need from our hardware architecture, from the CPU, is some way for the operating system to regain control. Right? The operating system needs to be able to say, you know, this program has been running forever. I need to go over and run the other program now. Uh, and, and in general, uh, the way that this gets implemented uh, is through something like a real-time clock or some other alarm. Uh, so it's an interrupt where the, the operating system can say, hey, uh, hardware, uh, I would like in 100 milliseconds, probably less than that, but in, in some amount of cycles or time, uh, give me back an interrupt so that I can recheck my schedule and say if someone else needs to run now in case this application is still running. This isn't, uh, so this may seem like a, a very reasonable way to solve this problem. And, and it you know, is very reasonable in that that's what pretty much all of the operating systems that we're experiencing with uh, today do this. Uh, the, the exception being some real-time operating systems where they have constraints in real time where the applications running need to be running at specific wall clock times. And so the, a different scheduling algorithm is needed. Uh, however, it's not uh, you know, the first uh, policy that came that, that operating systems went with. And so we can look back, uh, and, and it turns out that classic Mac applications, all the way up through Mac OS 9, so up until Mac OS 10, uh, and so that's really through the 90s. And likewise, uh, most 16-bit, uh, so old Windows applications in Windows NT, Windows 3.1, um, that were run even by Windows 95, Windows 98. So not this is pre-XP, so it's pretty early, so before, say, 95, so 80s to up into mid 90s maybe, um, use something called a cooperative multitasking model. And what that meant was the operating system didn't actually have a timer set where it would regain control and it was sort of preempting the applications. And rather it was expecting that applications would voluntarily return control to the operating system at regular intervals. So the application would be given full control of the computer uh, in that the CPU would just keep doing the instructions that the application asks for until the application provides a specific command that says, cool, I'm, I'm ready to break for a little bit, see if anyone else needs to do things. So the application ended up being somewhat more trusted in that regard because it was not up to the operating system, uh, but rather each application now you needed to make sure didn't have bugs and would be returning control. Um, and and the, the way that you saw this, the impact of this decision of cooperative multitasking was that 
on Macs up through Mac OS 9, if an application crashed, uh, if it froze, your whole computer froze. You had to restart your full computer. Uh, and, and one of the nice things that we've gained with uh, predominantly uh, preemptive uh, multitasking uh, that, that we find in, in current Mac, Linux, and Windows systems is that uh, any individual application can, can crash and can really behave pretty badly. Uh, and despite that, your, your computer generally remains stable, uh, which is maybe a testament to that containing, that containment working a little bit better in current operating systems than it used to in, in cooperative uh, systems where really you needed a really high standard of um, lack of bugs in every individual application that you were running. Okay, so I'm gonna turn now to the, the other sort of flip side where we look at uh, Linux commands uh, and, and sort of interact with the, the computer a little bit. Uh, and so I'm just going to go through a, a few of these uh, let me first describe what each of these does, and, and then we will uh, see them on the command line. So the ps command uh, is a way to list processes on your machine. So it will show you which processes are running. Uh, and by default, it shows you just the processes running in the current session, which is a, or, or process group, which is an abstraction. And we talked about this, uh, you know, overhead versus efficiency. Uh, and, and Linux has this additional layer that's separate from your user account, which is a process group uh, and looks at sort of uh, processes. So we'll explore a little bit how you can look at the processes running on your machine. Uh, we'll look at um, our view into the kernel. There's a few different ways to see what's happening with the kernel. Uh, one of the more interesting ways to see what's going on uh, in your operating system is that in Linux, you'll typically see one or two virtual file systems that are exposed by the kernel. And these expose information about the current status of your kernel. And these typically are mounted at slash proc and slash sys. These are virtual uh, sort of files that you can read uh, and sometimes write to control the settings inside of the operating system and to gather information and learn things about um, your operating system. There's a set of command line uh, programs that will look sort of like uh, a Windows process manager or Mac activity manager um, that, that show you, again, uh, in real time, which uh, processes are running, what's consuming your CPU, what's what's taking up how much memory. Uh, and the most basic of these is called top. It's installed on pretty much any Linux uh, system and gives you some view of that. So we'll explore a little bit how we can look at uh, the activity on your computer using top. And then finally, the, the last sort of four things here, well, Control-Z isn't exactly a process, but it's a, a way to send a, uh, an interrupt or to pause a, a process. Uh, and the rest of these are process control. So, so how do I stop a process? By sending it a, a signal to interrupt or kill it. So that's what the kill command does. Um, and then BG and FG uh, will background or foreground a process. So if I want to, uh, have, if I've got a process running and I want to be able to start another process or, or hide it in the background, um, these are useful commands for managing the programs or if a program freezes and you need to kill it um, by talking to the operating system directly because it has taken control of your keyboard. Uh, the, these are sort of some of the management tricks to be able to uh, navigate that part of Linux. Okay, cool. So I will now switch to a shell. So uh, here I am at a computer. The, the first thing that we're going to look at is the processes that are running on this computer. So I can type ps, uh, and this will show me the current processes. And you see that uh, what it's showing me is that the process ps has, is running. Uh, it has been running for zero seconds so far. Uh, and this is actually how much time it's using on the CPU, not how long it's been running. Uh, and I get the process ID. Uh, and so this process ID allows me to uh, interact with the process and potentially kill it. Um, and we see that this was launched from Bash, which is the born again shell, um, which is the, the process that is displaying this command line and, and running these commands. Okay. So this isn't the only thing running on this computer. And to see more, uh, I have a few options. I can do PSA and the A will show me sort of all processes in the group. And this includes a hidden process essentially. Um, and that is this A Getty, uh, so A-G-E-T-T-Y, and this is the sort of the teletype interface. Teletype is what the, the T-T-Y here is standing for. And this is basically the, um, the login process that is 
launching bash. So this is the parent of this. Um, I can use the U flag, so PSAU, and the U here is showing the user associated with it. So I can see that um, both of uh, these last two, the bash and the, the PS command, are run by my user, um, and that the, the Getty that runs this was run as root. So the parent here, the root user, started the terminal in which my bash command is running. Uh, if I want to see the other processes run by other users, I can use X. X shows the additional one, so PSAX or PSAUX will show me a much longer list. Um, and uh, with X, it also shows all of the uh, kernel threats, so the kernel, the different kernel tasks that are going on uh, uh, from the operating system uh, will show up in these square brackets uh, and will be interleaved. Okay, so this is the, the sort of the basics of um, the, the various processes and just getting a view of what's running. One thing this isn't really showing me in a super clear way is what's taking up time on this computer. So what are the uh, what are the relative you know things? What's frozen? What do I need to get rid of? Uh, for that, you would use top. Uh, top will show me the top processes and it will refresh somewhat relatively. So here it's showing uh, a bunch of information at the top. Uh, we don't care too much about this, but just to, to go through it, it's showing that uh, this computer has been uh, running for about 12 days and 15 hours, uh, that there's one user logged in right now, that it's not doing very much. So uh, these three numbers after load average are sort of the relative amount of CPU usage in the last five minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, I believe. Uh, it shows how many different tasks there are altogether. Um, that most of them are sort of idling, they're not running uh, immediately. Uh, some sense of current CPU utilization, uh, and in particular, how much of the CPU is being used by user tasks versus system tasks. And then some memory statistics. So this is how much memory is on the system and how much is in use. And then we have our uh, active processes um, by you know, it's, it's showing that the top command itself sometimes is taking some traffic uh, or some, some percentage of the CPU, and that the rest is mostly just sort of background uh, processes. Um, I can hit Shift K. Uh, oh, it's a different one for this one. Um, well, okay, so, so, so this is maybe the, the main use. I can um, uh, use the up and down arrows to sort of scroll through this. Um, and I use I type Q to quit. Um, you can get a little bit more information. This program is not always installed, but you can try it if it is. Uh, HTOP uh, provides sort of a, a slightly different uh, view of this. Um, it gives you a little bit prettier view of your, uh, you know, the four CPU cores on this machine and how much each of those is in use, a sense of the relative usage of my memory uh, and my swap space, and then again, a list of active tasks ordered by CPU usage. I can scroll through them, um, and it, it gives me uh, an ability to uh, kill uh, processes to stop them if I want. Uh, and I can again press Q uh, as well as F10 if I want to quit. Cool. Okay, so we've, we've seen what's running uh, in a couple different ways. Uh, the final way that I want to show you uh, is another command line program called PSTree. PS tree will show you uh, the tree of, um, you know, uh, system D was the initial program that ran on this machine, and it has spawned, it has started running a bunch of other programs. Uh, so for instance, it started running the Apache 2 web server, which is running on this machine. Um, and it also started running an SSH daemon. This is a way that uh, I can connect to the machine remotely. And in fact, that SSH daemon has started a sub process uh, which eventually led to bash and in fact the ps tree command itself running. Um, so this this gives you sort of a view into uh, the 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 full sort of set of things that are running on the machine and and how they are organized. So you can see what started what else. Cool. So we've got a sense of these different processes that are running, and we have some ways to view and and get a uh, some insight into what they are and how they've they've started running each other which programs have started running which other programs. Um, but how do we look into the kernel itself? Well, if I look at the root uh, of my file system, uh, I'll see a, a bunch of files, and this is sort of a, 
standard Linux root folder again. Um, so, so there's a bunch of different folders here. Um, and we'll start to understand more of these as we get through this course. But um, for instance, bin here is uh, you know, uh, executable programs that are needed relatively early. Boot is the uh, bootloader, the, the initial programs and configuration for starting up the computer. Um, these links in it are D and VM Linux are the actual kernel itself. So pointers to the, the core uh, operating system. And the things that we're most interested here of, in uh, today are the folders called proc uh, and sys. So uh, if I was to uh, do the long form lookup, um, you'll see that proc uh, is empty as is sys. And if I type the command mount, I will see what's mounted on this computer. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff here, but um, these are showing sort of all of the different uh, file systems and uh, things that are mounted. And um, let's see, there, there, we've, got, <laughs> we've got a bunch here, but the important ones are these top two entries here where I've got this magic file system called sysfs that is mounted on slash sys and it's of type sysfs. And I've got a magic file system called proc that is mounted at slash proc and it's of type proc. Okay, so this is basically saying that these, these two folders are actually virtual file systems. It's also showing me, um, for instance, uh, that I've got a temporary file system in this slash run slash user slash 1000. So that folder uh, is really just memory um, that uh, this block device, this hard drive, is mounted to slash boot slash EFI. So this is my this is the sort of initial code that selects which operating system to run. Um, and and somewhere else in here, um, there's a bunch of sort of back things, but here it is that that partition two of my hard drive is mounted on the root. So so here is the the root of this hard drive. Okay. So. Let's, let's start with slash, slash proc. If I look at what's in the proc folder, there's a lot, there's a bunch of these numbers which we can ignore for now, um, but there's a couple sort of files that give us some information about what's going on that can be interesting. Uh, and just to get comfortable with it, the first thing we can look at is a file called load average. So I can use the command cat to sort of print out the contents of slash proc slash load average and this file, oh, I got a T in there, load APG, um, will show me uh, something very similar to what top shows me, namely it shows me these three samples of how busy the CPU is. Okay. I can also look at uh, slash proc slash mem info for a high level view of the memory on this computer. And this will show me a bunch of information, including how much memory there uh, is, uh, how much is free, how much is available, how much is in cache, uh, you know, is, is there stuff in, in my swap, uh, and sort of all a bunch of other information about the state of memory on this computer. Okay. And finally, we can get some view uh, into the state of um, the system call interface and processes by looking at the file uh, slash proc slash interrupts. And what this is showing is it's showing me a set of statistics about uh, my my four CPU cores and how often a bunch of different interrupt types uh, or codes have been called. So I'm going to make this a little bit smaller and hopefully that will prevent it from wrapping. There we go. Um, so we have very few of these initial interrupts here. The first one that we have a really big number on is interrupt 127 has happened a bunch and it's coming from the ethernet card. And so this is the, the network card has been sending a bunch of interrupts uh, to, to uh, and they've all sort of been handled by core three of the CPU. Um, I've got a bunch of interrupts from my XHCI HCD. This is the uh, human control interface. So this is things like the mouse and keyboard are likely generating these interrupts. And then I've got a set of interrupts across all four of my CPU cores that are coming from my hard drive. Uh, and the hard drive on this computer uh, is stored in non-volatile memory. Uh, so 
that's why this is coming from the NVMe uh, is because this is representing uh, a set of yeah it, it, it's the non-volatile memory uh, device which is the hard drive in this case is generating these interrupts okay so we've got some specific interrupts that are being handled by my hard drive by my network card by my keyboard and mouse and then we can scroll down and we can find some additional special codes so we get some from local timer and so these are alarms this is the the operating system saying hey send me a local interrupt so come back to me in a little bit and these fire uh, fairly regularly um, and then we have calls uh, and so this these numbers here are showing how many interrupts are caused by system calls uh, function call interrupts okay. cool and so there's a there's a few others but but these I think are the the important ones awesome okay so we can get a, a, a bit of a view um, and, and there's a bunch of other things here as well um, so proc also has some a bunch of other sort of statistics you can get some statistics on the various devices uh, you can get some information about your C CPU you can uh, see what command lines were given to your CPU at startup um, so it's basically a bunch of different information about various parts of your computer often at a somewhat high level um, in contrast in uh, the slash sys device um, this is this is a little bit more structured and what it's going to give you access to is sort of uh, the ability to actually manipulate and interact a little bit more with many of the uh, devices uh, often you will access them through the type of device that they are rather than the specific device although you can also access them uh, through sort of direct identifiers of the specific device but by going through sys class you can get access to things like I would like to access all of the block devices all of the memory devices all of the input devices uh, all of the power devices uh, without specifying the specific device and so this provides a somewhat uh, general purpose way to get in and start interacting with the system based on the type of thing that you care about interacting with. Um, it also has some information, especially in uh, syskernel. Um, you can start to see things about uh, your kernel. So for instance, um, you can learn things about the capabilities, you can learn um, uh, about your security, uh, the actual state of things that are happening, uh, and you can start to get into some things around you know, the parameters at boot, um, C groups is a containment mechanism for how you limit a process's view of the overall file system and other capabilities. So this is a uh, another attempt at extended permissions. You can get some interaction with debugging of your kernel. You can attempt to uh, even uh, with the right permissions uh, modify your kernel internally. Okay. So some deeper. Um, ability to interact with parts of the kernel in slash sys and a bunch of information uh, in slash proc. Okay, so the final thing I wanted to talk about was process manipulation. So let's say you've got some process that just keeps happening. So one of one way to uh, demonstrate this, for instance, um, is I'm going to uh, open a man page. So uh, here I'm going to type man f open. I'm now on a man page and this page keeps running. But let's say it becomes unresponsive. I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pressing, I'm trying to press Q and it's not quitting. The program has frozen. What do I do? Well, one thing you can generally do is you can just close the terminal and start a new one and this will kill everything that's a child. But if I like this terminal or I don't want to fully quit it, what do I do? Well, on a Linux command line, you should be able to press Control Z and it should say, I've stopped this process. So if I type PS, I can see that man is still running. And man, in fact, launched a sub-process called pager. Um, but it's been stopped. Um, okay, so I, I stopped it. How do I get it back? Uh, and how do I, or how do I actually, so, so it's still running, uh, I think is, is the interesting thing from this PS. So even though I said I stopped it, it's still running. I didn't actually quit it. Uh, and so now I have to make a decision in some sense. I can start running it again, or I can actually fully quit it. So first, let's say how to start running it again. If I want to start running it again, I look at this number. Uh, one is now sort of the task in my local space. 
And so I can restart task one by saying foreground one. And that brings this back. Okay, and it's running again. Uh, and I can do control Z to pause it again. So foreground resumes a task that you've paused with control Z. Uh, if you want to kill it, you would run, uh, you, you would look at the, you, you can't actually say kill one. That, that is not what you want to do. Rather, you need to find the process ID. And in that case, this is 19498. And so if I want to kill this pro program, and that would be to, to stop it, to tell the operating system I don't want this to run anymore, I would type kill 19498. Um, and so this hasn't actually killed it because it's paused. And so it can't actually respond and shut down at this point. And so if I foreground it again, uh, I now see that it has, in fact, stopped. Uh, and now if I type PS, I no longer have it. Um, but it was not until I said foreground and unpaused it that the kill command actually took effect. Okay, So that the, the actual behavior here and the mechanics is something we'll get into a little bit as we get uh, a little bit later as we get into deeper to process control. Um, but uh, it's worth noting that what kill is doing is it's sort of saying when this thing starts running, what you should be doing is shutting it down. Um, and so you need to actually start it running again before it actually will quit. Now there are harsher ways that you can tell the operating system, um, hey operating system, I want you to really just unload and forget about this process um, that, that don't require the process to keep running in some sense. Um, but for most things, if you've, if you've paused it in this way, you're likely going to need to unpause the program uh, to continue. I showed you how to foreground, how to resume the process. Um, since man is a foreground process, it's a process that's expecting user input. Uh, foreground is the command here that for resuming it that makes sense. In some cases, you may have a daemon or a background process that's that's processing data that is not interactive. Um, and, and for those sorts of programs, you may want them to run but still have the ability to interact with your bash uh, shell, with, with your command prompt. Uh, and in that case, rather than saying foreground one, you can say background uh, one. Um, right now I don't have any background or pause processes, so this wouldn't uh, do anything. It'll in fact tell me that I don't have a process that it can background. But this will resume the process, so it resumes, but will not uh, reconnect it to the input from my keyboard. Okay. All right, I think that is the basics of process control on Linux. As a final uh, item for uh, thinking about in the next lecture, uh, I want you to think about how you would design the structure for responding to an incoming message from the network. Remember, we just saw that on the shell, that there's a lot of interrupts uh, based on network activity. And so as we structure our interrupts uh, so that they, they happen quickly, how would you design the various pieces of this and in particular, when do you run validation to make sure the network packet is valid, figure out which application it belongs to, and then get that network packet uh, to the correct application. Um, so so this is, these are the questions to uh, answer uh, before the next lecture. Wonderful. Have a good rest of your day.